didn't want to make this documentary personal. I wanted to offer an objective history of the historical roots of cancer in the UK. I quickly found, though, that this was impossible to do when the subject is so personal in nature. Even for those of us who have not directly been affected by the disease, its presence looms. Anxieties about staying out too long in the sun, eating too much smoked bacon and not enough turmeric are all born of a fear that one day we will hear the word cancer in relation to ourselves or a loved one. My father died from cancer when I was 16, so however much I might have wanted to remove myself from it, this documentary is personal. Cancer is a disease we fear. We've all heard it referred to as the C word, the word everyone fears hearing coming out of a loved one's mouth. I do believe that this fear is cultural, and I want to understand why. Why is it cancer which stands out, which we struggle to say? Why cancer? I want to know how this relates to gender, to accessibility of treatment. Throughout the making of this documentary, I was privileged to talk with two women, Louise and Eileen, who had both undergone treatment for cancer and had both lost loved ones to the disease. We talked about so much, I haven't included it all in the programme, but it meant so much to me, I'm so grateful to have been able to connect with them. These conversations, they do something with the pain caused by cancer. They address that hurt and make something new out of it. I hope that this documentary will start many more similar conversations. When Hippocrates of Kos looked at a tumour, its central mass, surrounded by a web of blood vessels, reminded him of a crab. Its body dug into the sand, its legs and pincers spread out around it. The Greek word for crab is karkonos. It may be difficult to understand the likeness, yet it's stuck. Scholars, maybe in an attempt to make sense of what Hippocrates saw, describe the spread of cancer in the body as a crab scuttling under the surface. Each description suggests that even before it had a name, Cancer was thought of as invasive, cruel and inescapable. I wondered, could the origins of the word oncology, the study and treatment of tumours, tell a different story? Yet in the same way, the word's roots could explain our current perception of the disease. The root of the word oncology is onkos, which in Greek means mass or burden. The first people to put the disease into words saw it as something which weighs the afflicted down. Before undertaking this project, I had, like many others, seen cancer as a distinctly modern disease. Yet through my research, I discovered that cancer had been around for as long as we have. The first recorded case of cancer is hard to pin down. It felt as though every piece I read told a different story. Whilst one author argued that the first case of breast cancer could be found in 2500 BC, another claims it was actually 1600 BC. Another puts forth the case of the preserved body of an early human ancestor thought to be 1.8 million years old and thought to harbour the earliest case of cancer ever to be found. An excavation of a burial site for the Chiribaya tribe, which occupied a portion of the Atacama Desert up until the late 16th century, revealed a woman with a perfectly preserved tumour in her upper arm bone. Then there is the story from 440 BC of Atossa, the Queen of Persia, History remembers her as a powerful, strong ruler. It also recalls how she suffered with a bleeding lump in her breast. Instead of summoning one of her many physicians, she went into self-imposed isolation, hidden away, cradling her chest. It was one of her slaves who finally persuaded her to let him remove it. We see here the beginnings of shame surrounding breast cancer, a queen who chose seclusion over treatment. This is something I want to investigate, the roots of shame surrounding the disease. One thing, above all, becomes evident when we consider cancer's early history, that the cases are few and far between. It is around the 19th century when we begin to see cancer instances rise. This led certain scholars to make the mistake of assuming that cancer was somehow caused by civilization. Instead, improvements in public health meant that Britons were living longer, and cancer was an age-related disease. Simply put, civilization gave cancer a chance to grow before its host was killed off by consumption, smallpox or the plague. Cancer, unlike these other endemics, had failed to be tamed by progress. Again I wondered, could this be why we fear the disease? We are, after all, a nation who have long been obsessed with control, 
a look at our imperial history tells us this much. Does the disease scare us because it's something we've been unable to dominate? This desire to prevail over cancer is something we see throughout the history of the disease. Reading the recommended treatment for oral cancer in ancient Egypt, it became clear how desperate the search for a cure was. Cinnamon, honey and oil is advised. Surgical management included burning the lesion with fire. Yet for hidden tumours, those which lay deep within the body, there was thought to be no possible solution. Early medical scholars seemed to flick between maintaining hope of an eventual cure and resigning a patient to death. I searched through the British newspaper archives for the word cancer. The results were, unsurprisingly, huge. Despite how large the quantity was, each article referenced a cure for cancer, whether it was reporting on a miracle case of a new procedure successfully ridding a patient of cancer, or if it was a warning against quack doctors profiting off of fake remedies. Either way, this obsession with a cure was apparent throughout. Obsession divulges into desperation. In this climate, fake remedies offered hope for those afflicted with cancer. This became such an issue that, in 1939, the Cancer Act was introduced to increase government mandate of adverts claiming to have found a cure for the disease. This is another key milestone in the growth of cancer as a culturally significant disease. Its incurability attacked by every area of society to the point where the government had to step in to take back control. The second detail which became apparent when searching through the newspaper archive was that each early case of cancer was one that would be visible from the outside. Cancers of the breast, neck and mouth are common. Today, these cancers are commonly treated before they ulcerate, that is, to break through the skin. This was not so often the case in the early history of the disease. The shame we saw in Queen Atossa's experience of cancer surfaces again here and will reoccur throughout this programme. Cancer sufferers at this time would have found it more difficult to hide their ailment. The world would see that they were afflicted. Even the language used to describe cancer patients at this time evoked shame and embarrassment. Families fought to carry the cancer gene were described as being tainted, as though they were dirtied, not even by the disease itself, but by the idea that they could be a harbourer of it. Consider also the symbolism surrounding the breast, particularly in this period, a symbol of fertility, giver of life, the mother's milk. To have this visible, ulcerating growth would have encroached onto this image, perhaps sowing seeds for the shame and fear surrounding the disease. This aspect of breast cancer was raised by Louise when I spoke of her about her experience with it. Her treatment had involved a double mastectomy. She described how male colleagues had occasionally made passing comments, making her feel that she was somehow less feminine. Attempts to maintain dignity and escape shame in the face of a cancer diagnosis can be seen in the Leeds watercolours, a collection of paintings depicting the various ailments of the inhabitants of the city of Leeds from the early 19th century. Here we see Mrs Prince, painted following the surgical removal of her right breast. Her eye is first drawn to the gaping wound on her chest. This is made all the more shocking, however, by its contrast to the woman who suffers with it. Instead of donning a patient's garb, she wears her fine clothes and bonnet. Is this her act of defiance, refusing to succumb to the status of victim? When I see this portrait, I see a visualisation of another fear aspect of cancer. This woman has her dress pulled open at a time when nakedness was still taboo. Cancer has revealed her vulnerability. She looks out of the picture, not making eye contact. Another deliberate choice, so that we are unable to meet her gaze and pity her. She looks away as if she doesn't need or want this from us. She does not want us to acknowledge this vulnerability. This portrait of Mrs Broadbent, also afflicted with cancer of the right breast, is similar in style. Though she wears no dress, she still wears her bonnet. Still we see an attempt to maintain civility, despite her diagnosis. It took a lot of searching before I came across Mrs Prince and Mrs Broadbent. Barbara Clough writes in her book on power and cancer care that the view from below is undeveloped in cancer history. This became starkly clear when searching through archives for patient experiences. I came across monograph after monograph discussing various treatments and diagnosis, but very little referencing the people who have to go through these treatments. The letters of Frances Burney are a rare exception. Burney underwent surgery to remove a lump on her breast before the days of anaesthesia. In a letter to her sister following the operation, Burney recounts the agony she endured. 
It is a raw, honest retelling of her experience with cancer. I'd advise caution with listening, as the details are shocking. About August, in the year 1810, I began to be annoyed by a small pain in my breast, which went on augmenting from week to week, yet being rather heavy than acute, without causing me any uneasiness with respect to consequences. Alas, what was ignorance? Bernie tries to ignore the pain for as long as she can, and here she berates her younger self for doing so. Her words highlight a central fear surrounding the disease. That to cure it is to race against time, and by delaying the diagnosis, one gives himself a disadvantage. Her choice of words are interesting throughout. They tell us a great deal about how cancer was perceived in the early 19th century, and give us insight into why we might care so much about the disease today. I was formally condemned to an operation by all three. I was as much astonished as disappointed, for the poor breast was nowhere discoloured and not much larger than its healthy neighbour. Yet I felt the evil to be deep, so deep that I often thought if it could not be dissolved, it could only with life be extirpated. Condemned. Frances Burney presents the disease like a punishment, an evil that has penetrated her body. Like the crab imagery I discussed earlier, cancer has crept under her skin, invaded and taken up residency. She continues with this idea of her diagnosis being a death sentence. The doctor is her judge and the operation her execution. When we hear what she endured on the operating table, we can understand why. Here we see the different experience of a modern-day cancer sufferer versus an early patient. This added aspect of having to go through an operation without anaesthesia was a death sentence for many. Could this be what helped lay the foundations of cancer as such a cruel disease? M. Dubois placed me upon the mattress and spread a cambric handkerchief upon my face. It was transparent, however, and I saw through it that the bedstead was instantly surrounded by the seven men and my nurse. I refused to be held, but when, bright through the cambric, I saw the glitter of polished steel, I closed my eyes. I would not trust to convulsive fear the sight of the terrible incision. A silence the most profound ensued, which lasted for some minutes, during which I imagine they took their orders by signs and made their examination. Oh, what a horrible suspension. I did not breathe, and M. Dubois tried vainly to find any pulse. Yet, when the dreadful steel was plunged into my breast, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, nerves, I needed no injunctions not to restrain my cries. I began a scream that lasted unintermittently during the whole time of the incision, and I almost marvel that it rings not in my ears still. So excruciating was the agony. This was the reality of cancer patients at this time. Whilst the conditions of surgery have changed, the concept of cancer taking over the body of its host remains, as we will come to see. We cannot imagine the pain Bernie experienced, though her writing demonstrates why we need to focus on including more patient testimonies in medical archives. Bernie lived till the age of 87. Had she undergone her surgery 80 years later, the story may have been different. Her letter may have been filled with yet more anguish. Had she undergone her surgery 80 years later, she may have been subjected to a radical mastectomy. Radical mastectomy. A surgical treatment for breast cancer, in which the surgeon removes the entire breast, including the skin, nipple and areola, all auxiliary lymph nodes and the chest wall muscles. It was a treatment born from the idea that the more a surgeon cut, the more he cured, and it was as destructive as it sounds. This theory was so pervasive that there are records of surgeons operating on breast cancer patients purely for the effect on morale. I see this as a prominent cause of the fear surrounding cancer here in the UK. Early treatments were so cruel, it cemented the idea that the treatment of the disease was almost as terrible as the thing itself. They physically stripped away at the patient's body, taking away their defences and leaving them vulnerable. And these treatments began long before the radical mastectomy was first proposed. In the 14th century, Ambrose Pear advised that small breast tumours should be removed with sulfuric acid, while Tabor, in 1721, attempted to simplify the mastectomy with a guillotine-like instrument, not far removed from a medieval torture device. You may have noticed that with the earliest cases of cancer recorded, the majority were cancers of the breast. This, along with the prevalence of uterine cancer, created the idea that cancer was a female disease. Frequently, the ailment was joined with other feminine disorders, such as hysteria. This early feminization of cancer continued into the 20th century with the pink ribbon campaigns. 
This gendering of cancer can also be seen in the earlier access issues relating to the disease. Cervical cancer in the 19th century was commonly associated with mothers of large families, meaning women with low socioeconomic status. This led to the perception of uterine and cervical cancers as diseases of poverty. In a way, this was accurate. Most recommended preventative measures for cancer would have been far easier for the wealthy to carry out. Improved diet, clean water, exercise and clean clothing were amongst the advice given by physicians. Access to these things was a privilege. Studying these early histories made me realise that from the point when this disease was first given a name up until the present day, there have been issues of accessibility, patient individuality and experience. I had yet to consider how these early roots translated into the way we talk about cancer today. 1940, and Great Britain's battle for life is on. defeated. Our towns and our country were saved. The suffering were cared for, not without cost, not without the devotion of all who were in the fight. More than 60,000 of our people lost their lives through bombing alone. All that modern science and engineering skill could achieve was thrown into the battle. That is over. But there is another battle in progress. It goes on year after year against an enemy just as bitter, even more relentless. And that enemy is disease. Despite the unceasing efforts of doctors and scientists, more people died last year in the United Kingdom of cancer alone than were killed by bombing during the whole war. So the fight must go on whatever the cost. Now what essentially is cancer? The human body is made up of billions of tiny cells. Each cell has the power to divide and grow into two new cells. This is a normal life process which goes on all the time. Occasionally, however, a cell or group of cells begins to multiply in an abnormal way. This condition we call cancer. Some forms of it, especially if treated in good time, are now curable. But we have not yet discovered what we are after. A certain cure for every case. And this is a challenge to us all. The British Empire Cancer Campaign have taken up this challenge, supporting their efforts of the men and women of this country, those who stop to think those who understand the urgency of the work. The campaign cannot prevail without your support. Your contributions buy vital, costly equipment. Your contributions finance long, painstaking research into the cause and cure of cancer. Every penny counts. So give all you can to this appeal, and we shall go onwards to victory together. When my dad was undergoing treatment for cancer, I used to hate it when people referred to it as his battle. I hated it even more when he died from cancer and people told me how sorry they were to hear that he had lost the fight. Both Eileen and Louise shared my annoyance at the use of this war imagery. Eileen felt that the vast majority of people who have cancer would do anything to be cured, so it's not really a question of winning or losing. Louise agreed. If you lose the battle, the assumption is that you didn't fight hard enough. It assumes it's a battle that you could win, but you can't always win the cancer battle. It creates this idea that if you fight hard enough, you will get over it. I can't claim to know the opinions of all people affected by the disease. For some cancer patients or their families, this imagery could help motivate them, encourage them to keep fighting and win. What I do know is that I didn't like it, and I wanted to know where it came from. Britain's recent history is a story of continued attempts to assert dominance and control. 
We participated in the imperial race eagerly, keen not to be left behind. At its height, the British Empire was the largest in history, covering around 25% of the world's surface. With this power came anxieties about holding on to it. Britain's failures in the Boer War heightened these fears. At the same time, cancer was becoming an ever-looming threat, and so the disease became synonymous with the dark forces threatening Britain's empire, an internal enemy which needed to be eradicated. In fact, when Cancer Research UK was founded, it was called the British Empire Cancer Campaign, forever entwining the British crest for world domination with attempts to dominate this destructive disease. As British patriotism and fighting spirit continued into the First and Second World War, campaigners piggybacked on the spirit of wartime to encourage the public to aid the fight against cancer. The newsreel you saw earlier is a clear example of this, running smoothly from commending fighting spirit during the Blitz to urging viewers to challenge their bravery towards the war on cancer. Still, I was shocked by the similarity of wartime propaganda posters and posters for the British Council campaign. Take these two examples. Both make use of women to arouse feelings of sympathy in the viewer. The icon of the helpless maiden in need of protection. This is a theme which runs through many propaganda posters. It sets up a binary between the protectors and the protected, the fighters and the damsels. Usually, this binary runs along gendered lines, with men shown to be strong and women weak. This theme is clear in cancer campaign posters. Here again, we have the sobbing woman, desolate, head and hands, both women are shown in white, which has been used to symbolise purity and innocence. This made me recall earlier perceptions of cancer, which I explored earlier, the idea of the disease invading and infecting clean bodies. Yet another example, we again have the damsel being taken away by the enemy in the wartime poster. The cancer campaign depicts the archetypal British soldier, a rather romanticised view, he wears no armour and brandishes a sword. In both examples, the enemy is represented as a beast of some sort. On the left, cancer is embodied in a demonic creature with forked tongue and curly tail, while on the right, the German soldier is depicted as a blood-crazed ape. Each of these examples create the idea of us against them, the noble British people against the evil cancer. I would argue that this lay the foundations for the use of war imagery in the present day. I wanted to take a look at recent Cancer Research UK adverts to understand how war imagery has been used. I will show a few short clips from these adverts. These can be very emotive, so I understand if you choose not to look. The examples from the early 2000s focus on trying to get the audience to feel great sadness. They centre on the loss caused by cancer. The colours are grey, the setting dismal. The clips are set to mournful renditions of fields of gold. One example I will not show, as it received backlash from viewers for making cancer look truly terrifying and serving a cruel reminder to those who have lost a loved one. The clips make use of wartime language throughout, asking the viewer to play their part in the effort to control all cancers. It sets up a clear opposition, a battle against a common enemy. What's more, there is a focus on female patients and children, another common technique in war imagery which continues here. Moving into the 2010s, we see a clear change in style. It is far more optimistic. Instead of having patients trapped in dimly lit hospital corridors, we see them leaving, walking towards the sun, supported by a family member. This Race for Life advert from 2013 stands out to me. I remember seeing it shortly after my father's diagnosis, and I still find it as striking as I did then. The advert makes use of this battle spirit, but in a more modern way. It harnesses fear surrounding cancer and turns it into anger, with a focus on togetherness. By addressing the disease directly, hello cancer, it personifies it, it turns it into something we can attack. There is still a distinct Britishness to the adverts. Cancer, you prat. Abuse cancer. Fundamentally, the advert plays again on us against cancer, our attack on cancer. I would argue that this puts a more modern and, in my opinion, more effective spin on this war on cancer. What's more, it does not suggest that those who have died from the disease have lost their battle or failed in some way. They are also fighters, and our anger at their loss could be turned into efforts to change someone else's outcome. I read a lot of books to make this documentary, and whilst their content was illuminating, it was the way they were written that really stood out to me. They are a useful way to summarise the themes I have explored over the course of this documentary. Firstly, so many began with the story of a patient, often a woman, either dying from cancer or receiving a diagnosis. The authors seem to use this as a literary device to draw the reader in. 
Second, there was a running theme of cancer being unforeseen and unprepared for. Often the writer made a point of emphasising this. Not only was it unforeseen, but it came exactly at the wrong time. When the patient is a new mum, has just got a new job, is about to get married or is in the prime of their life. Another reason for their cultural significance and fear. Cancer can never, ever come at a good time. I can't blame these books for doing this. I myself did it at the start of this documentary. I began telling you the story of losing my father. I think when it comes to cancer, as I said, it's impossible not to tell these individual stories. Because when we think of cancer, we think of the people that it affects. I will be forever grateful to the NHS nurses and doctors that treated my dad during his five years as a patient. But there is a part of me that asks, would the outcome have been different if he had been able to access private healthcare services? The NHS is severely underfunded. Their staff are critically overworked. I considered the issues of accessibility in early cancer history, and sadly, these issues continue today. The NHS offers fantastic treatment, but when resources are limited and time is stretched between multiple patients, issues which increased funding could alleviate, things go wrong. Louise's daughter was turned away three times when she went to her doctors to ask for a checkup on the lump on her breast. By the time they took her case seriously, her cancer had surpassed the point of treatment. The Macmillan nurse attending Louise's husband was the only nurse assigned to work free hospitals. With, her, with their time stretched so severely, their quality of care suffered. Eileen's husband was delivered the news that his cancer had spread to his brain whilst he was alone following an MRI scan. Increased funding is needed to ensure that doctors and nurses have time for each patient, time to check and double check. Time, a fearful thing for cancer patients. Beating the disease is a race against time. The quicker the diagnosis and treatment, the better chance of survival. When your only option for treatment is the overworked NHS, this becomes an issue of accessibility. Furthermore, studies have found that higher socioeconomic status is associated with greater awareness of cancer risk factors. Being able to eat foods rich in antioxidants is a luxury and should be acknowledged as one. The ability to take time off work to follow up a cancer worry or treatment is a luxury. The issue, as Louise pointed out, is that cancer diagnosis doesn't mean everything else stops. The other payment, the mundane, everyday stuff that you need, that keeps going. It's just that suddenly you have to pay for that alongside stopping work for illness, alongside travel costs to and from appointments. This fight against cancer is not one where every soldier is equally armed. Cancer treatment has come so far since the days of Francis Burney, but more can be done to address the economic inequalities which underpin cancer treatment. This starts with our government. I set out to understand, essentially, why we care so much about cancer here in the UK, why the disease is so feared, why we talk about it in the way that we do. I wanted to see how this related to gender, accessibility and the roots of the language we used to talk about the disease. I don't want this documentary to generate fear. For me, its creation has been a therapeutic process. I have spoken with some wonderful women and I've been reminded of the strength we have within us. Louise and I had to laugh as we compared the ridiculous things people had said to us when they heard about our loved one's cancer diagnosis. After her husband was told his cancer was untreatable, he still had people telling him to stay positive, to which he replied, well, I've renewed my passport, so that's staying positive, isn't it? Perhaps we need to let go of our British inability to admit we are scared. We get closer every day towards a time when all cancers, cancers will be treatable. Yet the disease has such connotations that we should not deny patients and their families the right to feel afraid. Yes, we will beat cancer, but it's okay to cry, to be frightened, to not know what's going to happen. And all you can do is be there for that person and make sure that they know you are. Well.